Good evening. I am Rhonda Regan, one of the members of the Town of Newcastle's Holocaust and Human Rights Committee. On behalf of the co-chairs of our committee, Ali Rosenberg and Stacey Science, and the other members of the committee, as well as the students of Enough, I would like to welcome you to tonight's Yom HaShoah Holocaust Remembrance Ceremony. Yom HaShoah is a day set aside to commemorate the six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust, as well as the heroic acts of survivors and rescuers. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Before we begin our program, I just want to ask everyone to please remain on mute throughout the evening so that the speakers can share without any interruptions. Also, if possible, please keep your cameras on, your videos on during the program so that we can have the feeling of a community, even though we're not able to be together in person. It's now my pleasure to welcome Cantor Ezring, Cantor Sternlieb, and cantorial soloist Ali West, who will sing Eli Eli. Thank you, Cantors, for that beautiful song. I am Allie Rosenberg, and along with Stacy Science, we are the co-chairs of the Town of Newcastle Holocaust and Human Rights Committee. Before tonight's program gets underway, we would like to take a moment and recognize the Chappaqua Central School District, led by Dr. Christine Ackerman, for providing our students with the opportunity to hear survivor testimony. In February, under the leadership of Mr. Corsilia, Dr. Schoenbart, Ms. Devane, and Ms. Abair, the Greeley 10th graders heard from Judy Altman, a survivor of Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen. In May, the 8th graders at Bell and Seven Bridges, under the leadership of Mr. Wiener, Ms. Kelly, Mr. Lamel, Dr. Mazza, and Ms. Mangier, and Ms. Lichtenstein, We'll also hear from Ms. Altman, as well as from Mr. Sam Mahara, who was a prisoner in the Japanese internment camps in the United States. A recent study showed that students exposed to Holocaust education demonstrate higher critical thinking skills and a greater sense of social responsibility and civic e effic efficacy if survivor testimony was part of their experience. We commend our district leaders for providing our students with these incredible opportunities. It is my deepest honor 
to introduce Ivy Poole, Newcastle's town supervisor. Good evening, everyone. It is my honor as Newcastle town supervisor to welcome you to this evening's event in commemoration of Yom HaShoah. Yom HaShoah, as we will hear more about this evening, is Holocaust Remembrance Day. It marks the beginning of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of 1943, when Jewish resistance fighters defied the Nazis and fought for freedom and dignity. Of the 9 million Jews who resided in Europe in the early 1930s, approximately 6 million, roughly two thirds, were systematically killed by the Nazis. As many as a million of those who were killed were children. And while the Nazi regime was particularly focused on the elimination of Jews, we know that there were other groups that were targeted due to their ethnicity, religion, political beliefs, and sexual orientation. Yom show is a time to commemorate, honor, and reflect on those who endured the pain, the suffering, and the loss that were the result of the Holocaust. To commemorate Yom HaShoah, many communities seek to incorporate themes of personal and social justice into their observances, reflecting not only on what was lost, but on our ongoing collective responsibility to remember the past and to build a better and safer future for our community. For the second consecutive year, we're commemorating Yom HaShoah this evening virtually. As I've said before, these Zoom events are incredibly powerful in that they enable us to come together at a time when we are longing for connection and community. And I remain incredibly grateful to the Holocaust and Human Rights Committee here in Newcastle, as well as the students of the Horace Greeley High School Enough Club for their tireless efforts to create these kinds of opportunities to remember and reflect and to chart our path forward together. So thank you all again for joining us this evening, and I'm looking forward to listening and learning from our esteemed guest speakers this evening. And now I have the distinct honor and privilege of introducing two incredible, inspiring young men, Sam Rosenberg and Charlie Gordon, who are the co-presidents of the Horace Greeley High School Enough Club. Thank you for joining us tonight to commemorate Yom HaShoah. My name is Sam Rosenberg. And my name is Charlie Gordon. Yom HaShoah is about reflecting on the past and using those lessons to help create a better future. Recently, hate has become acceptable. It would be so easy to turn our backs and ignore the hate, but that's what happened 76 years ago. Yom HaShoah is a chance for us to remember and to teach that hate is not acceptable. The mission of our club enough, which stands for Educate Now on Understanding Genocide and Hate is to empower students to stand up to hate and to develop a community of tolerance through education and the understanding of people's differences. As the next generation, we understand that we have a responsibility to listen to the stories of the Holocaust, to retell these stories, and to educate each other. Elie Wiesel once asked, why write the memories of the Holocaust? Why share the experiences of the Holocaust? For the dead, it's too late. His answer, because it is never too late for our children. Now, I would like to introduce Pat Pollock, member of the town of Newcastle Holocaust and Human Rights Committee. My name is Pat Pollock, and I'm a 33-year resident of the town of Newcastle and an active member of the Newcastle Holocaust and Human Rights Commission, as well as the Council on Race and Equity. It is an honor for me to serve on these committees in defiance of hate and injustice. Tonight, I have the honor of announcing the winners of our second annual Holocaust and Human Rights Art and Writing Contest. This year's submissions were exceptional. We received artwork, poetry, and essays that displayed the students' deep understanding of the, and emotional understanding of the survivors' experience during the Holocaust and how those experiences can be applied to today's world. 
For the essay contest, students were asked to respond to one of three questions. And for the arts, we asked students to read a survivor's testimony and create a response through the arts. Without further delay, I would like to announce the winners. The winners of the middle school essay contest are honorable mention, Casey Barron. Third place, Rachel Chen. Second place, Sydney Posner. First place, Jared Science. And Jared will read his essay. My great grandparents' childhood was lost. Their families were killed. Their life as they knew it was destroyed. Never again. Never again means what happened to my Holocaust survivor great grandparents and so many others. This should never happen to anyone again, no matter your race, your culture, your religion, or what you believe in. It also means that we need to be accepting of each other, no matter our differences. We all are humans. My great grandfather was a teenager when he was taken away and is 95 now. It is imperative that we hear all their stories and listen and learn from them now more than ever because they won't be with us for much longer. My job is to ensure the phrase never again becomes a reality. By telling their stories, we can serve as a dutiful upstanders. To be an upstander, we have a duty to teach people about what happened to the Jews so that we will be able to act together to prevent it from happening again. To be an upstander, we have a responsibility to learn not to make fun of other people or say mean things to each other just because they may look or sound different or have a different religion or race. We need to stop hateful acts before they become acceptable. When you see someone doing something wrong, you should not be silent and you should act. My great-grandfather was kidnapped on the side of the road as a kid in 1940 by the Nazi soldiers. He was then brought to a room where, when he waved his last goodbye to his dad as they took him to various death camps, including Auschwitz. Upon his arrival, he has put in his gas chambers line, but his dad's friend who worked there moved him to the other line and saved his life. In the camp, his dad's friend helped him and got him more jobs, which got him more food. So he was lucky enough to survive such harsh adversities. Toward the end of the war, they were first forced to march for months, but the Russians came and saved them. My great-grandfather went back to his hometown where he could find no one. My great-grandfather then went to a displaced persons camp where he met his future wife. Once they had their first baby, they went on a boat to the USA where they settled in Rochester, New York. I have been sharing their stories with other people to ensure they know why it is important to stop hate. The hardships, adversities, and ordeals Holocaust survivors endured must be told and retold so no one has to go through them ever again. The winners of the high school essay contest are honorable mention, Marielle Siegel, third place, Max Gross, second place, Netra Iswaran, and first place, Jason Chung, and Jason will read his essay. Six million Jews were killed, the teacher read, as a dull white slide moved quickly across the smart board. Students, uninterested, sat hunched in their seats, eyes glazed, indifferent to the sound of six million people dying, perhaps because they had previously heard the same statistic in their third and fourth period classes. Living in a predominantly Jewish community, you'd expect more students to be devastated to hear about the Holocaust, but it seemed the majority were uninterested. Why? Over time, as a statistic becomes a number, and a number fails to remember each and every person who was stripped from their families, abused, and brutally murdered. There is no way to a number, but a personal story can connect the reader to a cause. In 10th grade, I had the incredible chance to read and examine Ellie Wiesel's Night in my English class. The tiny blue book given to me as a homework assignment soon became one of the most impactful and eye-opening narratives I'd ever read. The story follows Wiesel as he survives the Holocaust and is forced to choose between his life and his faith in God. Readers can feel Wiesel's anguish during these moments, thanks to his personal narrative. And the impact of a personal anecdote allowed me to understand the severity of the situation and reflect on my own privilege having security and the right to free expression. 
We can hear about the thought slaughter of millions of people, but experiencing it is incomprehensibly painful. Seeing people get shot and fall to the floor, hanging in front of hundreds of people, and abused and beaten on the streets may seem fictitious, but Wiesel does not leave out any detail that's remained ingrained in his mind. The events Wiesel expresses echo the voices and struggles of the millions of lives that were lost during the Holocaust. The one experience of Wiesel leads the mind to imagine the terrors that millions of other Jews have to face. Although we can leave a 55 minute class and forget about what we learned about World War II, the survivors and the victims never had the option to just forget. As a result, it begs the question, why should an event such as the Holocaust worry someone who is not involved? Because it's not just about remembering a day and memorizing facts for an upcoming World War II test. It's about never forgetting the day that shattered the world. It's about never forgetting the relatives, children, and lives lost as a result of an opposing religion. It's about never forgetting that people were thrown into camps, starved, assaulted, and left in the streets to die. Later that day after school, I brought up the subject with some of my friends. To my surprise, it seemed that the majority of my friends had little understanding of what had occurred during World War II. It may, have been, it may have been due to the lack of attention on the subject in their own classrooms, or it could have been because they had just simply bucked the information that they had crammed the day before their World War II exam. Nonetheless, it appeared that no matter what school a student attended, there was no influence or genuine empathetic understanding of the horrors of the Holocaust. And as time passes, these numbers and events begin to fade from memory, which can be dangerous. In fact, according to a survey conducted by the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany, a startling two-thirds of American millennials had no idea what Auschwitz or the Holocaust were. 66% of 1,350 millennials polled had never heard of the Auschwitz. A catastrophic incident that occurred less than 100 years ago appears to be feeding the minds of younger and future generations. Furthermore, recent events at the Capitol building serve as obvious warning signs that action must be taken sooner rather than later. Amidst the chaos, a particular man caught the attention of several news outlets and individuals. On the day of the riot, Robert Keith Packer, a local, wore a sweater labeled Camp Auschwitz with a skull on the bottom to represent the death of, million Jews, death of millions of innocent Jews. We have not yet progressed as a country as long as people are comfortable rejoicing and displaying such heinous propaganda that glorifies the killings of millions of people. People wearing shirts that praise Auschwitz screams ignorance and complete oblivion of our society that has lasted for years. While we advocate for change, there's still injustice and suffering looking for our attention. Victims of starvation, discrimination, and political persecution. Never again preach the recognition and remembrance of lost lives. It's not a day to revisit the sorrows of the past, but rather move forward to discourage tragedies from reoccurring. Our world appears to be in a perpetual conflict and on the brink of total chaos. And now more than ever, we need to accept that events such as Holocaust so that they never happen again. As time passes and Holocaust survivors pass away, it's critical that we share their stories and ensure that an event as horrific as the Holocaust never arise again. While we have the time and security now, we must act by constantly bring up conversations about what happened rather than avoiding difficult topics. To avoid history from repeating itself, our generation and future generations must comprehend the atrocities of the past. And as Ali Weissel once said in his Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech, neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes you must interfere. My name is Sam Mikesell. I am a student in Enough, and I'm also a member of the Town of New Newcastle Holocaust and Human Rights Committee. The winners of the Middle School Art Contest are Honorable Mention, Molly Fine. Third place, Aaron Sook. Second place, Miles Brensilver. And first place, Gabriel Faro. Gabriel will now read his prompt. Hello, oh, I am Gabriel Faro. I'm in seventh grade at Bell Middle School. And thank you for keeping the memory alive and honoring the victims of the Holocaust. I have named my art piece No More. With this, I want to explain the horrors of history that should never happen again. I have been inspired in one of the humiliations that the U.S. suffered throughout the Holocaust period. At the time, the only men who wore beards were the Jewish and the Nazis, to feel superior and humiliate the Jewish, cut the Jewish beards. Thank you for being here. The winners of the high school art contest are honorable mention, Janice Sung. Third place, Zoe Herman. Second place, Claire Nam. And first place, Lizzie Ozinski. And Lizzie will now read her poem. Unlucky is luck. It began with a simple choice, left or right. 
Left was the lucky side, the people forced into slave labor who faced starvation and beatings and fear were lucky. The ones who lived with the reeking smell of burning flesh, the sight of smoldering smoke, the sound of excruciating screams were lucky. And the ones to the right, they were the burning flesh and they were in the smoldering smoke and they made the excruciating screams. The ones who lived in fear rather than die in fear were the lucky ones. It began with a simple choice, left or right, live or die. But the Jews did not get to make that choice. It was their enemies, their perpetrators, their murderers who made the choice. How lucky can a Holocaust survivor be? How lucky can someone who escaped the murder of six million of their own people be? Getting stripped from your family is not lucky. Living in hatred and fear is not lucky. And surviving, something that billions of people can do every day with no effort at all, is not lucky. And so, with the unluckiest luck of all, some people lived. I'm Cheryl Dorfman. I'm on the committee for the Newcastle uh, Committee of Holocaust and Human Rights. It's really hard to follow um, the students. I want to thank them for presenting their art and their essays. It just blew me away. Um, it was very tough this year making, <laughs> selecting the winners because so many were worthy. Um, it is my distinct honor to welcome Westchester County Executive George Latimer to speak now. Thank you very much. It is uh, uniquely appropriate to see young people and their um, their essays to uh, discuss what happened in the Holocaust, because it is, it is the fear uh, of all of us who are of an older generation. I'm of the generation uh, that would be the children of the Holocaust survivors. And um, now that we look at generations that could be our grandchildren, that this horror can't be forgotten. And the only way that the remembrance of it and the hope that it never occurs again will be when young people like those that have uh, delivered their essays and their artwork uh, remind the world that what happened was evil. And that when, when we let hatred rise to the way it does, when we give it public sanction, and in the case of Nazi Germany, when we give it sanction from the leadership of the nation, then these horrors can come back to us. They've come back in Cambodia and Uganda, uh, but we've, we've even seen it on the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia, in our own country. So may this, uh, this remembrance be perpetual year after year, the Yom HaShoah movement. May those of us who are not Jewish keep in our hearts the same anger and commitment uh, to never see a Holocaust again, along with our Jewish brothers and sisters. And may there always be young people as articulate as these that we've heard tonight to be able to remind us of what our duty is to remember and to never forget. Thank you, County Executive Latimer. My name is Solvay McShay and I'm a member of the Newcastle Holocaust and Human Rights Committee. Tonight, I have the pleasure and privilege of reading a message from President and Secretary Clinton. We wish we could be with all of you gathered for the second annual Town of Newcastle Yom HaShoah. On this solemn occasion, we join you in remembering the victims of the Holocaust, those who survived its horrors and those who did not, and honoring their memories by vowing to learn from the atrocities of the past so that they are not repeated. By ensuring that the Holocaust remains a sharp thorn in our collective memory, you are preserving the lessons of history, keeping them vivid and real to remind us we all have a shared responsibility to each other in the ongoing struggle against prejudice and intolerance. Sadly, Recent events close to home, across the country, and around the world show that we still have a long way to go. We are deeply grateful to all those organizing and participating in tonight's ceremony for staying vigilant against hatred and intolerance of all kinds and reaffirming our common humanity. Hi, I'm Tema Baumbach. As the child of a survivor, I grew up hearing stories of the Holocaust from my dad and his friends, fellow survivors who were like family. It was never a big event, just parts of their past being dropped in conversation. 
It wasn't until I was in middle school and a classmate asked if he could interview my dad for a social studies paper that it really occurred to me that my experience of hearing these firsthand accounts was not the norm and maybe I should be listening a little more carefully. As the years went by, my appreciation of their importance and urgency only grew and I was overjoyed that my father and many of his friends were able to share their testimonies with the testimonials with the Shoah Foundation to ensure that the world never forgets. Today, most of the storytellers I grew up listening to are no longer with us. My family and I are beyond grateful that my dad is still here and at age 96, and I am very glad that he has agreed to share his story with our community to bear witness. And so it's my pleasure to present to you now, Paul Edelsberg in conversation with my husband, Mark, and our daughter and Enough Club member, Caroline. Hi, everybody. I'm Mark Baumbach. I'm Caroline Baumbach. And we are joined today by my father-in-law, Caroline's grandfather, Paul Edelsberg. Paul, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. All right. We're going to talk to you a little bit about your life, which is um, a very unique one and, uh, and, in our opinion, an extremely important one. So let's just start by asking you uh, the most uh, obvious question. Uh, where were you born and, uh, and, and what was your family like when you were born? I was born in Poland in a small town, Wodawa. There were 7,000 Jews and about 100 Gentiles. My father had a hardware store and he, he was a very religious man with a beard and we had a nice life. We weren't rich, but we weren't poor. And you had how many sisters? I had two sisters, an older one and a younger one. And the older one was named what? Ethel, and the younger one was Tema. You went to public school? I went, when I, when I turned five, I went to Haida, the Hebrew school. There was a Haida that was there. Then at age seven, I went to public school. You went to public school with Jewish kids and also the local Polish kids? Yeah. How did the Jewish kids in your school get along with the Gentile kids? It, it, sometimes we fight, but in general, they live their life, we live our life. Was your family very religious? My mother was religious, my father was religious. When I got older, I was not so religious. Saying when I was say 10, 11, I used to like to go Saturday to watch a soccer game. And I had to go to on Saturday to, to the temple every year, every week. But that's something I had to do, whether I liked it or not. How old were you when the Nazis came into your town? It was in 1939, and I was born in 25, so I was by. 14 years old. And, and how did you first feel the, how did you first feel the presence of the, of, of Germans in, in your town? So in the beginning was, they start right away taking Jews to put them to work. Like in our town was uh, before, before the war, uh, was a army camp. And the Germans took it over. So the, the SS or the Gestapo at that time, they went to pick up Jews. They took my mother and my father, take them to that camp to clean up the camp. So, and then they came home at night to see you? Yeah, they, they, they let us, in the beginning, they let us go. Well, they, the Germans operate by us in our town, there was, uh, I mean, a Jewish committee, and and was Jewish policeman. And if the Germans need something, they uh, tell them we need it. Give, 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 give it to us. Also, when they came in, they round up I don't know a thousand Jews maybe. He put them in the, in the synagogue and they demanded uh, jewelry money, if not, they'll kill it. So they kept them by four days. 
and people give away whatever they had and they let them go. In 1940, my father was called in to go to work. He left, never saw him again. I had a neighbor, he was a harness maker. So I said, Paul, come and help me. So I got some food, I got maybe a dollar. And I went to work with him. 41, the war started, they went, the Germans were straight. They didn't have a shot against them. And it stopped starting, they start catching Jews and kill them or something. My father I never saw again. One day my sister, when I, I wasn't home, I was with the harness maker. My sister went out, she never came back. Your father had been taken away, you never saw him again. He built, I think he built Sabibor. He built Sabibor, that's what I was trying to lead you towards. So yeah. He built Sabibor, which is a concentration camp for people. And I think they, whoever built Sabibor, they tried it. It was first people to try him. So once they were done building the camp, they executed. Pardon? Once they were done building the camp, they executed the people who were building the camp. I'm sure. I never, I never saw, them, but I'm sure nobody from them came back. And then, and then, your younger sister Tema, who who Caroline's mother is named after, she she was taken one day, and you never saw her again. I don't know where she went. They probably caught a bunch of people, which they took to Sabiba. She was one of them. I was more with the harness maker. So you were living with the harness maker and your mother and Ethel were hiding in their house? They were in the house. And do you remember the last time you saw them? Yeah, I came, I came home one time. <clears throat> and I wasn't bread. I saw them one time. But... After I went in the woods, they came, they round them up, they shot them. They shot everybody at the farm? All the Jews. All the Jews, including your mother and your older sister? Yeah. In, in, we wind up in the woods in Pinsk. Pinsk had a big wood. You know, but there was 1943. Uh, in part of 44. We live, I lived in the wood, slept. They used to dig, dug out holes. He used to sleep there. And then in 1944, the Russian came in, the Russian army. We got so all the partisans which were there because the time from the time we came from the Polish part to the white Russian part, they make a use of us. I had not to, we used to go blow up tra railroads. The life in, in, in the woods it was just as scary as maybe a camp, but not as much. You, you know somebody maybe kill you, they're coming. But you had a gun, or you think if he kills me, I might kill him first. You saw some horrible things for someone who was pretty young. Didn't you see someone once um, have too much and, and kill themselves right in front of you? Um, didn't you tell me once that someone just had too much and they killed themselves right in front of you? Oh yeah, there was one guy. It was a, he was, I think, a Uzbek or something. There wasn't the partisans. And we went for some job we did, we blow up something. We were all wet, think, and he, 
cleaned his rifle, put his toe on the trigger. He started thinking, what is kind of life that, you know, you start talking, no sense. He never said, shut up. And he pressed the thing in front of me. He killed himself. I got the bird after, after being uh, 15, 60 months in the woods with the Russians. The Russian army came. Anybody on the 70, 17, they sent to Russia to school. Who was 17, they drafted you to the army. And this, they shipped us out to Russia for basic training. We were there about 12 months and they sent us back to Poland. We had some fighting with the Germans until 1945. 45, there was a big offensive and they pushed uh, across the German border I got wounded in my arm, so they sent me to the hospital. This is the shrapnel that you got in you? Pardon? The shrapnel? Yeah, in my arm was still there. And I, I, spent, I spent in the hospital three weeks. Then uh, from the hospital, I was in the army for a while, till the 8th or 9th of May. In the war was over. So I was, I got a job with the Russians. I spoke some German interpret, interpreter. Then I figured, I, I find out about the DP camps in Germany. I went illegally to Czechoslovakia, from Czechoslovakia to Austria. If we must be at the job. For people who don't know what a DP camp is, tell people what a DP camp is. A DP camp happened after the war in Germany. There were a lot of, a lot of uh, forced labor. And some didn't want to go back to, to Russia or, or Czechoslovakia. So the, the, the UNRWA set up those camp for the people. It stands for displaced persons, right? Yeah, displaced persons, yeah. And then I moved out from the DP, DP camp and I was in a, in a, living in town. It's a nice town. So they let me where you want to go. So I picked the United States. So I went to Bremen with a boat, I came to New York. I want to stay in New York. The, the organization which brought me over said, no, you have to go to Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> How did they pick Des Moines, Iowa? Don't ask me. I didn't, I used to pronounce it Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in Des Moines, Iowa 10 months. Then I find a friend in Chicago. Well then, how did you support yourself in Des Moines? Pardon? How did you support yourself? What was your job? Well, I had arrived on Sunday, and on Tuesday, I worked in a garage on the coating. You know, the years ago, the, the, the cars, they used to run the coating. They yeah. showed me what to do, I did it. Did you speak English? Pardon? Could you speak English? I don't know. <laughs> that was what you said? I don't know? <laughs> that, that I didn't speak any English at all. I used to go in the evening. I used to go to classes. I came to Chicago. My first job was in a foundry. Then I got from the foundry. I worked as a full of brushmen, go door to door selling. I spoke some English. And in 61, I went in my own business. What was the business? Pardon? 
What was your business? What'd you do? I used to make pet supplies. But you didn't have a pet. No, but uh, I know what to do for the pets. <laughs> How did you decide to do that of all things? Somebody dragged me in. Somebody said, what do you know? Because I used to do uh, for horses, harnesses and that. I said, if I can make, fix a harness, I can fix a, a color for a dog. When did you start your family in Chicago? When I start, I met a girl and I got married. And we had a baby, which is your mom. Your was, mother. She, was she a Jewish girl? Pardon? A Jewish girl you met? Funny, she was a convert. She was a convert? Yeah. So you had, you had Tema, you named her after your sister. Yeah. And then what happened to your, to Tema's mother, your wife? She got sick, she had cancer. She lasted about two and a half years. They gave her six months. And then I was alone. And how old, how old was Tema when you met, when you met your present wife, Sally? I was Tema. Seven. Seven, seven uh, years? Eight years. Seven or eight, right? Even. Seven years. Seven. And and Sally also had a uh, history with being involved in, right? She's also a survivor. She's she young. was younger and she, her mother, her grandfather must have no farmers or something. She was hiding too. They survived the war. And so you met Sally and you would now had someone to help you raise Tema. Tema is a good kid. She was a good kid. And she's a good mother. I don't know, she's a good wife, <laughs> you know. Yes, I agree with that. We're never proud to have that family. We're and proud to have you. Do you remember the trip we took? When we all went, to, do you remember the trip we took when we all went to Poland together with you and we visited Vladava together? Yeah. <coughs> that was a hard day for you, I think, right? Yeah. Because we all stood in the, we stood in the lawn of the house that you grew up in. And there's no there's no Jews in Vladava now, right? Very few. I don't know if there's one. I don't think there's any. Yeah. That's a long story. And it's a short story. That's a good way of putting it. But most important, it's a very important story. And I think on behalf of the Enough Club, right, we'd like yeah. to really thank you. Yeah, we're, we're very appreciative that there's people like you who are willing to share your story to the community. <laughs> You're 96 years old now. You've lived to see your grandchildren, three, all four of your grandchildren get uh, B'nai Mitzvah. You've lived to see... You know, you're. I, I didn't think I'd make it to see. You always say that, but you're still around. Yeah. And uh, it's really, it's it's one of the greatest things that you could do is share your story with other people. So, thank yeah. you all for taking the time tonight to do this. Thank you so much on and, behalf of me and the Enough Club. Thank you. And thank you very much. Much. I'm happy to see you too. <laughs> well, I'm ha we're happy to see you too. Okay. Mr. Edelsberg, Tema. Mark and Caroline, thank you for sharing your incredible story with us this evening. As Ellie Wiesel said, to listen to a witness is to become a witness. Tonight, we are all witnesses. My name is Jack Rosenberg and I'm a member of Enough. Now, we will light seven candles. We light six candles in memory of the six million Jews who were persecuted and murdered simply because of who they were and what they believed. We light a seventh candle in memory of the millions of other groups of men, women, and children who were discriminated against by the Nazis and <laughs> by their hand. The communists, the Roma, the Sinti, the LGBTQ community, the disabled, and all those who dared to oppose Nazism. Yeah, but you're not gonna be able to hear it. We would like to welcome Rabbi Bergman, 
Rabbi Bruso, Rabbi Greenberg, and Rabbi Jaffe, who will lead us in the Mourner's Kaddish. Yit Gadal, Auschwitz, Bid Gadash, Lodz, Shimei Rabbah, Honar, the Alma, the Rach, Yurute, Babi Yar, the Amlich Malchute, Maidnek, the Chaye Hon, Uviome Hon, Birkenau, Uvhaye de Hobet Israel, Kovno, Vagala, Uvisman, Kariv, Janowska, Bimru, Amen. Yehe Shme Rabba Mubarak Leolam Ome Amaya Ibarach Vishnabach Theresenstadt Vit Baar Vitramam Buchenwald Vit Nase Vitadar Treblinka Vitale Vitalau Vilna Shme de Kudisha Rihu Bergen Belsen Viela Malthusen in Kol Birchata Vishirata Dacha Tushbechata v'nechemata Minsk, Damiran b'alma, Warsaw, the Imru, Amen. Ishlama Rabba min Shemaya, v'chayim alenu v'alko Yisrael, v'imru, Amen. Asei shalom b'mamad, huya asei shalom, alenu v'alko Yisrael, v'imru, Amen. Thank you, Rabbis. Now, please welcome Reverend Dr. Jacobs. Good evening. I'm really honored to be here with you, and I thank Enough, Alexandra, and Stacy for allowing me to share with you an experience I had when I was on my sabbatical in the fall of 2019. I chose to take a two week bus trip that included visiting five different concentration camps in both Poland and Germany. As you might imagine, this trip raised many questions within me, but the ones that stayed with me were about the intersection of hope and faith. These questions kept coming up as I saw the horrors and the devastation that humans can bring on other humans. As I walked around the camps, I kept wondering how anyone could survive such horrendous and unspeakable conditions. I heard the stories about how people were treated and was quite frankly disgusted by them. I also mourned that people could be so cruel to each other. But I also found myself amazed by the resiliency of human beings as I heard the stories of some of the brave things that people did while they were in the camps. Those stories brought feelings of hope as the counterbalance to the evils that I was hearing. From one concentration camp survivor who was 11 when he was sent to the first of four concentration camps he endured, I learned that many adults who were in the forced labor camps had adopted a mindset that they were not going to let the Nazis win. He learned from them the need to survive. That is what he said gave he and his fellow prisoners hope. They knew they needed to survive in order for Hitler not to have the final word or for his final solution to succeed. This 11 year old learned about the importance of maintaining hope to ensure the continuation of the Judaic heritage and traditions. Pincus Gutter survived. And from what I understand, he now lives in Canada with his family. But you know, hearing about people trying to consciously maintain hope, even in the midst of such horrors helped me to understand better the depth and the strength of hope. When it's combined with faith, it can help us to weather the intense storms of our lives. History, if we choose to learn from it, has taught us that treating others in disparaging ways does not lead to peace. It leads to war and it leads to destruction. It does not leave room for understanding and acceptance and peace and hope. And without hope, we perish. As I was walking around Auschwitz, trying to comprehend what I was seeing, I took this picture. This picture is of the rubble of one of the crematoriums at Auschwitz. When the Nazis realized they were not going to succeed in their extinction, an order came down to destroy the evidence of the death camps. 
So they started blowing up various places, including the crematoriums in Auschwitz. These ruins remain today much the same as they were when the camp was liberated in 1945 by the Soviet army. These ruins contain the ashes, the ashes of those who were killed by the Nazis. Well, as I walked around these ruins, I saw a remarkable sight. I have zoomed in on what may be difficult for you to see. Coming up out of the ashes and concrete was a green flowering bush. Amidst that devastating place, I saw a sign of hope. And we need hope because without hope, we will perish. As we know, this past year has been a difficult one for almost all of us between the pandemic and the rise in racism and hate crimes and gun violence. It is hard to maintain hope. But I choose to believe that hope shall bloom and that we humans will one day learn to treat each other with love, with acceptance, and with great humility, since I do believe that we have all been created by the one creator God. Hope shall bloom. I pray that in whatever difficult situation you find yourself in, you will remember those who struggled and endured impossible conditions, but somehow, Many of them found the hope that they needed to continue on. May you too be able to find within you the strength and the hope you need to carry you through. I am so humbled that you have allowed me to participate in this important remembrance. We must never, ever forget. Thank you. Reverend Jacobs, thank you so much for your powerful and moving message and remi for reminding us that the story of the Holocaust is also a story about hope. May hope bloom. We thank you so much for joining us tonight. Your participation ensures that the world will never forget. Uh, as, we conclude, as we conclude tonight's ceremony, I ask you to stand up, turn on your flashlights on your cell phones and hold them up high. As Alan Holt said last week at the conclusion of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum's Day of Mem Remembrance, light your cell phones as if it were a candle, lifted high as a symbol to survivors, but also to us, the new generation that will shape the future of humanity. Let's say together, we will never forget. Uh, if, uh, if we want to unmute now and say that. Uh, we, we, we will never, will never, never forget. 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 Never forget. We will never forget. Never forget. Never forget. We will 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 never forget. It's a lot of screens up. We would like to conclude this evening with a song performed by Cantor Ezring and Cantorio. Cantorial soloist Ali. Ani Amin, I believe. I believe with complete faith oh, yeah. in the coming of the Messiah. Ani Amin, Ani Amin, Ani Amen.
אמונה שלמה בביאת המשיח, בביאת המשיח אני מאמין, ואף על פי שיתממה עם כל זה אני מאמין. אני מאמין, אני מאמין, אני מאמין. ואף על פי שיתממה עם כל זה אני מאמין אני מאמין אני מאמין אני מאמין אני מאמין. Thank you, Cantors. And thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. I would like to thank all of our participants and I'd like to thank the students as well. As the program concludes, we will now show the outstanding artwork submitted by our middle school and high school students for our second annual Holocaust and Human Rights Contest. We invite you to stay and watch as the art is shared on your screen.
Thank you again for joining us this evening, for remembering, for ensuring the world will never forget, and for viewing those beautiful submissions from our students of the Chappaqua Central School District. Thank you again. Good night. Be safe and be well. Thank you.